There you go. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. As part of efforts to develop evidence and um, actions towards um, a double duty food policy bundle in Ghana, my team and I have uh, been looking at the evidence on food marketing restriction policies and how this can improve food retail, um, can improve um, food marketing and also generally population health in order to provide evidence for current best practices regarding how to develop and implement such policies in LMICs. Now, um, just to set the scene, we do know that today's food environment is quite different to that experienced by previous generations. Okay, We know that the food environment is changing rapidly, especially in low and middle income countries, with a wide availability and heavy marketing of many products that are high in sugar, fat, salt, etc. Now, um, I thought I'll just briefly provide some historical mapping to food marketing. So the need to protect children from the harmful impact of food marketing has long been recognized. It started with the protection of children that was guided by the UN Convention on the Rights of, of a Child, um, which states that children and young people should be able to access information um, um, and this must protect them. This information should protect them from harm. Okay, that's where it started from. Then um, it went on to the global strategy on diet, fiscal activity and health, um, which also um, emphasized the need to have um, um, food marketing restriction policies to protect children. Subsequently, in 2010, we also had the um, at the 63rd World Health Assembly, um, WHO member states endorsed a set of 12 recommendations on the marketing of foods and non-alcoholic beverages to children. Okay, there, there are other examples, and we recently have also just had a launch of the WHO guidelines on policies to protect children from the harmful impact of food marketing. Now, <laughs> in spite of this, <laughs> excuse me, to date, no country has implemented a comprehensive policy, okay? As of May 2022, a total of 60 countries had adopted policies that restrict marketing of food and sugar sweetened beverages to children. Um, 20 of these countries have mandatory policies um, um, and several countries tend to have multiple approaches, so mandatory and voluntary, and there's always a, a, a wide variety in terms of scope, channels, or settings that are covered. Um, it was on this basis that we set out to do this review. So our review aimed to consolidate the evidence on the impact of food marketing restrictions on children's exposure to unhealthy food marketing, specifically to look at the impact of food marketing policies on their exposure, but also to identify the challenges and facilitators in implementing um, effective food marketing restriction policies. So we conducted um, a review of reviews because we realized there were a lot of reviews out there um, or a lot of studies that had already been done on this topic. So we did a review of reviews, which is known as an umbrella review. Um, we searched six databases, so Medline, Embase, Cochrane, and three others. Um, yes, we just focused on publications in English and the search was, um, the limits was up to 2023. We just synthesized our findings narratively. Um, so I'm just briefly going to um, share some of our findings. So we, this report, so this presentation is based on seven reviews that was conducted across many countries, many of which were in high income countries. So two thirds of the countries in those reviews where, you know, United States of um, um, America and Canada, two thirds of the studies were conducted in these two um, countries. Um, some of the reviews included studies conducted in Europe, including Germany, Norway, the Netherlands, just one review, it's just only one review focused um, on low and middle income countries. Now, um, what are some what are some of our findings? So we realized that um, numerous 
food industry groups have established self-regulatory programs that refer to, they, they describe that as um, responsive advertising, while a small but growing number of countries have enacted mandatory policies. Now, <laughs> the evidence shows that self-regulation has not meaningfully reduced children's exposure to unhealthy food marketing or to sales of unhealthy foods. OK, but then we also realize that um, the, there's a lot of mixed findings as to whether or not the policies resulted in reductions in unhealthy food advertising or not. You know, there's a lot of mixed mixed findings in the li literature. Now, what we do know is that food marketing policies may reduce purchases of unhealthy foods and um and lead to unintended consequences for public health. The studies also show that several studies, um, I mean, the review of review showed that several studies showed desirable effects of food marketing policies on child food marketing exposure, but the evidence on diet and product change was very limited. Um, excuse me. We do know that from, from the reviews that adherence to voluntary codes may not sufficiently reduce the advertising of foods or reduce children's exposure. I think I mentioned this point already. Now, with regard to facilitators and barriers, a lot of them have been mentioned by the previous presenter. So facilitators included, you know, strong political leadership, um, um, having good supporting evidence, intersectoral collaboration, community support, um, yes, among others. The barriers also included the fact that some of the, the complexity of the regulatory processes, okay? Um, there's also conflicting interests, lack of financial and human resources, um, interference by industry, then a weak evidence-based ambiguous categorization of um, 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 yes, ambiguous categorization and lack of a good criteria for which to be policymakers could use to restrict or to ban certain foods. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the evidence was from high income countries, but we decided to just look at um, the few low and middle income countries that were included to see what we could find. Now, the barriers and facilitators were really similar. I've just highlighted a few here. So industry engagement or support, um, monitoring and evaluation, and where accountability systems were put in place where some of the facilitators that were identified, um, important cross-government agencies or multi-stakeholder collaborations in these countries also facilitated the implementation of these policies. The barriers, just like what I shared earlier, included implementation gaps and barriers that related to the legal framework, lack of a human and financial resources for implementation. And, and then again, ambiguity in policy wording. Um, so lack of a criteria for food, similar to what I mentioned earlier, ambiguous categorization or lack of cri good criteria uh, for food to be restricted or banned. And what were the recommendations from this reviews, the seven reviews? So I've summarized this in this slide. There's a need for more evidence, particularly for low and middle income country, and also evidence on the longer term impacts of interventions and their wider potential to change um, health behavior in order to ensure that policymakers can be more confident in the decisions that they take. There's a need for better communication strategies, you know, for financial and social support, even before some of these policies are put into place. Policy restrictions must go along with the provision of alternative healthier choices. And then finally, prioritization of mandatory marketing restriction approaches that are aligned with the recently launched um, WHO recommendations. So in summary, what were we saying? That globally countries are actively implementing, you know, the WHO's recommendations, but very few are from um, Sub-Sahara Africa. Um, in Ghana and Kenya, for instance, policies exist. So we do know that these policies exist to restrict um, 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 the marketing of these foods, um, but implementation has been rated as low. Mm. There's inadequate government action in enforcing these policies. 
Um, and so government often favors self-regulating approaches and even though accumulating evidence shows that this have minimal impact on reducing children's exposure. Um, so finally, um, some of these points I've already mentioned, yes, even though the evidence is really limited for Sub-Sahara Africa or LMICs, we can take some lessons from the evidence from, you know, this review, these countries, while we still work on context relevant data as well. So adherence to voluntary codes may not sufficiently reduce the advertising of foods which undermine healthy diets or reduce children's exposure to this advertising. Now, luckily, I think WHO has just launched some new guidelines. So thankfully, the new WHO guidelines are quite explicit in saying that, you know, mandatory government regulations are better than the industry self-regulations. In the past, mm -hmm. it was kind of an option for countries to just, you know, choose, you know, but now they are actually focusing on encouraging um, countries to just go for the government regulations. So I guess uh, for the purposes of why we did this review, Ghana's policy should be guided by the current guidelines by WHO. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hiba. Such a very provocative um, presentation. Um, it gets me thinking about the regulation in South Africa, which is also um, the in industry self-regulating. And even though um, this is brought in by the government, then um, still there are hiccups because the government is always um, reactive than proactive in, in, in regulating, in like checking um, what's happening at the um, food industry level.